Aloha. Welcome back to Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Esapi on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with James Kunani Tokioka, a state representative from Hawaii, Kauai. Uh, Jimmy has made a positive impact in the community, in the hospitality industry, and later in the political world. He has been on the Kauai County Council for 10 years. And in 2006, he got elected to the state legislature where he is now. <laughs> Welcome, Jimmy. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, can, you tell us, uh, uh, can you tell us why you first ran for office, especially as a former Republican, and some of your proudest accomplishments while in political office? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that question, Jimmy. But I first want to start by thank you. Um, Thanking you for having me on the show, Dennis. I, um, you know, I've always admired you and respected you because you know, talk about doing so much for the community. You know, our work is um, minuscule compared to the the things that you are responsible for in building and constructing. And you know, without people like you and the engineering company, a lot of responsible stuff on this island would not happen. So, um, I'm sure everybody who watches this show knows of, of, about you in, in some form. But I just wanted to go on the record and tell you thank you because um, every time I um, I need a spell checker, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or every time I need to have a question about engineering or you know many many things, you know Dennis, you're the first person on my mind that I call. Thank and you. for people who are, are wondering why Dennis is laughing, you know I send out I send out brochures every year from my office at the state capitol. And one year, Dennis found a typo, and he sent it to me, and he said, oh, Jim, by the way, there's a typo in your brochure. <laughs> me, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm a terrible speller to begin with. I thank, <laughs> I thank God for spell check, and I thank God for other smart people who know how to spell. Um, when I read it, I know it's spelled wrong, but, you know, sometimes we all miss stuff. But uh, Dennis peruses <laughs> through it. And, you know, he always calls me and says, uh, you know, you, you, it's okay to pronounce it like that or, or write it like that, but it should be like this. So, um, you know, for somebody who you say, you know, didn't graduate. Uh, <laughs> wait, how did you graduate yeah. Dennis, from my school? Uh, uh, yeah. English, second language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they sent me to. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's interesting for people. It's, it's good for people to know, you know, how... Um, meticulously this guy reads. And so that, that, that also goes down into your work as an engineer. And, um, you know, thank you, Dennis, for, for, for all that help. So yes, what you said about uh, my, my elections and the career that I, I took on, the 10 years on the county council started in 96, and then it went from 10 years from there to the state house, now it's 15 years. Um, the question that you asked about um, Republican, um, I, I wouldn't say I, I wasn't. I ran as a Republican in 1996 for the county council. Um, I, I was a, a nobody in, in office, and I'm, I'm a very competitive person. And when people tell me that you know you cannot win, um, I take that as a challenge. And that's what happened because Marianne Kusaka, who was the mayor at the time, she was the one who asked me to run for office. And um, you know, I was I had a restaurant at the time. And, you know, I, I didn't know much about um, running for office. I didn't know much about campaigns. But what I knew at the time from running hotels and restaurants is that you need a good team around you. You need smart people. You need people who can help you meet people on this island. So I, I, I put a team together. Uh, Dan Mackey was my campaign manager when I, uh, when I started. And until this day, he still is my campaign manager and a very, very good friend. Um, a very, very good businessman, so I, I learned a lot from him. So that's what got me into office. And I say that because um, uh, getting elected right after Iniki, um, I thought I had a good skill set to help reopen the island because my, my background was uh, hotels and, and restaurants. So I spent a lot of time on the mainland, 11 years before I came back to open my restaurant here. Iniki put a damper on that. I had to delay it for a year, almost two years. Um, but the reason I ran for office was I thought I could make a difference after Iniki marketing the island, you know, make, uh, making sure that um, we put things in place so that the, the visitors can come back and, and have 
the same experience, if not a better one, after Iniki. So that was the impetus for me to run for office. And, you know, running as a Republican, as, as you know, and everybody, a lot of people know on this island, it was me and Brian Baptiste that started at the time. And we were both, both approached by uh, Marianne Kusaka. And bless, bless his heart, uh, Mayor Baptiste, I learned a lot from him about campaigning because that guy was nonstop. You know, um, we, we did a lot of things together when we were on the county council. And I, you know, as I was going through this show and I was on Felicia Cowden's show three weeks ago and Mel and Charlie's show a while ago, I was just looking at some of the things we did when we were on the county council. And, and there was a lot of things that we got done, but we had a good team, you know, Ron Kochi was the county council chair. Daryl Kaneshiro was the planning chair. I was there. Brian Baptiste was there. Randall Judge Valenciano was there. Um, at, uh, in the beginning, Billy Swain was there. So we, we, we had a really good team. Um, and, and I learned a lot. But one of the things that you know, I feel you know, we accomplished was um, housing. And you know, part of it was after Iniki, there was federal money for housing. So you know, the Lihui Theater was, I was at the tail end of that you know, making the appropriations for that. But, you know, um, whether it's Ele Ele Nani from A and B and, you know, the Kukui Ula project, I think the Kukui Ula project to me is one of the projects that we got a lot of, um, not a lot, but we had some, uh, a lot of people that weren't supportive of the project. But when I explained to them the conditions that came with the project, some of them understood, you know, like the roundabout in Poipu, right, Dennis? Probably the best roundabout yeah. on this island. And that was put in by A and B, and that was put in as a condition to the project, uh, the wastewater treatment plant. You know, nobody likes to talk about wastewater treatment, as you know better than anybody else, Dennis. But, you know, if uh, somebody who's going to come in and develop a, an area doesn't pay for it, then guess who's going to pay for it? The county. And if the county is paying for it, then guess who's paying for it? Your property taxes. And that's, you know, that's why all of these entire, uh, conditions that we put in, a lot of it was housing. Uh, Poea, I think it's 134 units. Pa'ana Village, one and two was 50 each. So that's 100 units there. When, it, when, when they get up to 300 units, then they have to build additional housing at uh, Kukuyula or you know, write a check to the county. So those were, you know, a, a lot of good conditions. Uh, Eli Eli Nani, 152 units. And just off the top of my head, trying to remember some of the projects, that's um, just started from one development. And then the park, uh, the park that we approved as well is going to be main, maintained in perpetuity by the developer. Where does that happen? So, you know, um, I'm proud of a, a lot of the things. And like I said, it was a whole team effort. It was not one person, but a lot of people working together. Lima Ola was a condition of, um, a part of the condition of Kukui Ula. Um, you know, it's just the, the sidewalks. If you walk around that area, the sidewalks are, you know, put in. And, and those things are all not cheap. And, and some of the conditions NB and DMB had to put in way before the project that got developed. So. I'm proud of, of those things that we accomplished. I'm one of the things at the county council level um, is the, um, with your show, Dennis, the Net Expo. So when I first started, you know, the internet had just been going off in, in 96 and in, in Silicon Valley. So we, we put a team together and brought a lot of people here from the Silicon Valley to teach our kupuna and our children, you know, what was happening on the internet. And if you think about 1998, a lot of people didn't know what the internet was and it was slow and it was dial up and it just has progressed so far, but I still have contacts with the people that came for that, uh, that expo. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. I think another one of the biggest accomplishments that I'm proudest of in my political career is the smoking ban in restaurants and bars. So that, um, uh, Council Chair Kochi at the time, myself, Brian Baptiste, we, we worked on that and it was tough because there were a lot of people. There were a lot of people that were against um, the smoking ban. I can remember, and I can share his name because, you know, he, he talked to me after it. Rob's at Rob's Good Times Grill. He was upset. He said, Jimmy, that's going to kill my business if you, if you ban smoking. And I said, Rob, I have a restaurant too. 
And I, I think about the employees that, that are in that restaurant. And I don't want them to, you know, suffer secondhand smoke. And, you know, Janice Pond and her team uh, worked very, very hard on that. And so today, <clears throat> shortly after that, maybe like a month or two after we passed that bill, Rob came into my office at the county council office and he said, Jimmy, I got to apologize. You know, you were right. I said, Rob, I wasn't trying to be right. I just trying to do what I think is right for the community. And he was so happy. So now you walk in, Rob's, and you don't walk out of there smelling like a like a cigar or I mean a, a cigarette. Um, so that's probably one of the things at the county council level that I'm proudest of. Um, the bike path, you know, I, I just think of all of these things that that happened from the time that I was there. We initiated, you know, mayor, mayors, uh, Yukimura and Kusaka and Baptiste were all part of the introduction of it. But when we were there at the county council, that's when it started happening, and and you know, it's a beautiful thing, in my opinion. It runs all the way from Manahola, and I cannot wait till it connects to Kauai Lagoons and um, Pokuala and that area. It's it's something that um, it's 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 going to be, and it is used now by a lot of local people. You see a lot of local people riding their bikes, walking their kids. Um, all of the different comfort stations that are along the way for people to eat their picnics, lunches, bentos, and and you know, very very. Uh, happy that they can sit in the shade and, and, and watch all of that. So, you know, that's the time that I had at the county council. But when I, um, the question that you asked when I joined, I didn't know anything about the Republican Party. And when I, when I went to some of the meetings, I was like, oh, I don't represent um, a, a lot of what they stood for. But I did have people that um, I respected, but I knew that my, my heart and the things that I stood for as far as you know, helping people who need help, helping people that cannot help them, that have, that have disabilities, you know, for people who don't know, my son's deaf. And he was born shortly after I got elected. And then we found out that uh, he, was, he was deaf. And so, you know, that just changed, you know, anytime you have kids, then it's with disabilities or with, uh, without, it changes your life. And then I could see how, you know, people who were blind and deaf and people who had, you know, any type of disabilities were um, not always at the front burner of issues when it came to uh, legislation and politics. And I thought that um, I, I, I could make a difference. So here on Kauai, when I was at the county council, there was an ADA lawsuit regarding the captioning of the county council meeting. And so Ron Kochi, I, I give Ron Kochi credit for this because he knew um, Pono was deaf, uh, but he said, we have two choices. It is something that should be for everybody, captioning, or then if it's not for everybody, then it shouldn't be for anybody. And that was a profound thing that he said at the time because I was like, so you're, you're saying that you're going to take off the meetings from TV if it's not fair because the captionings are not on. And he said, yeah. So it, caption is not cheap. I think the first contract that the county put out, I think it was in the neighborhood of 300,000 at the time. They didn't have as many uh, word to voice um, technology or voice to text technology, sorry. Um, so, uh, you know, Ron was instrumental. Uh, speaking of Ron, he's just texted me. I don't think he's watching the show, but he just texted me, sorry. Um, and, you know, Kauai was the first one. So when I went to the state capitol, I told Speaker Say, I said, you know, it's not fair for deaf people or even people who are hard of hearing to have not to not have a meeting caption. So we got that the year after I got there, uh, we got funding to, to caption the uh, meetings at the state capitol. So, you know, certainly, certainly uh, proud about that. But over the years, it's just uh, continuing to make sure that the voices of the people on the neighbor islands are heard. And I think we have a good team on Kauai. I, I know we have a good team on Kauai, and we're very fortunate. Uh, Ron Kochi is the Senate president. Um, so it's uh, very helpful to our community that, you know, when, when Ron uh, is given an issue, that uh, it's certainly going to uh, have a lot of credibility and weight behind it. So um, I think, you know, I, I feel very confident that we make a great team and I'm, I'm proud of uh, the ability to work with a team that um, is tenured and, and knows the different um, neon, nuances of uh, the government. 
because <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Yeah, you, thanks. You could, you could go sideways in a minute. Yeah, thanks. I'm sure your um, family neighbor, uh, Dr. Paul, the district health officer, was happy with your smoking ban. And, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, he was. Yeah. Um, you know, as we're talking about the legislature, this past session, uh, he passed some bills. The governor, Ige, vetoed some of the bills, mm-hmm. and the, leg- the legislature overrode them. Can you tell us about some of them? Sure. Um, I think technically, a lot, he, he vetoed 28 bills, and of the 28 bills, more than half of them were technicalities because of the Americans uh, Recovery Act funding from the federal government. Um, one of the biggest ones in, in House Bill 200, which House Bill 200 is the budget bill. So everything in that bill is everything in, in the government in the state of Hawaii. Uh, but the governor um, found out after the, legis- uh, the, the session closed that some of that money could not be used for um, paying off bond debt. And so if we didn't correct that, we couldn't pay off our debt. So, um, you know, the, the bill had to be vetoed and fixed. So it was a, a little bit of a complicated section, uh, uh, a special session because we had to uh, veto and fix. Uh, it's never happened before. And it's never happened before that a governor has vetoed uh, 28 uh, bills. One of the biggest uh, controversial ones was House Bill 862. And that was the funding for HDA. So a lot of the uh, organizations involved in the visitor industry, a lot of the nonprofit organizations that had funding through grants from HDA for Kalo Plantation Days, and, and um, they, they got on the emails and, and texted us and called us and emailed us to let us know that it was important to them that the funding be kept. <coughs> Excuse me. But... Um, their legislators at the, the Capitol that had some concerns with how HDA was funding projects, the procurement of the funding of the project. <clears throat> um, I was not one of them. I, I felt like HDA um, was doing a lot of good things in the pillars that they were addressing. I think that um, <clears throat> John DeFries, when he started, he came up with a plan and he was trying to execute that plan. It's hard to execute a plan when you're going through you know, the biggest uh, downturn in tourism in the state's history. Um, but that was, that was one of the biggest uh, bills that was up in um, the veto override and the rest were pretty much technical stuff. So, you know, we, we went in last week, Tuesday, and we finished on Thursday. And we think that all the bills are fixed now. And, you know, I'm hoping they are because every year on each side of the, uh, legislature, House and Senate, about 2,000 bills get introduced on each side. And at the end of the day, only about three or 400 bills pass. So it's just weeding out some, the, the good and the bad and uh, <clears throat> making sure that it, it's all properly, uh, the oversight is proper on each of the bills. So that's, that's pretty much the biggest thing with, with the special session, in, in my opinion. Yeah, thanks. Uh, speaking about HTA, now a lot of people are saying we got too many tourists or too many effects of tourism. Mm-hmm. So what can the legislature do? Okay, so during COVID, you know, let's just go back to uh, June of last. During during that time, everybody was like, "Oh, we got to do something to open up the economy to get people um, to wear their masks to do this so that we can get visitors because we can't." Um, there's no jobs. There's no people. A lot lot of the restaurants were closing on Kauai. Everything was closed on Kauai for a while. So I I would say that, you know, tourism is not like a water faucet. You know, you cannot turn it on and turn it off. But what was amazing is when um, the mayor and the governor uh, took away some of the um, conditions as far as uh, quarantining and all of that, the numbers came in unbelievably strong. I just think that that's a, a few things, uh, Dennis. It's bent up frustration for people not traveling. It's people not being able to go to other countries, Japan, South Korea, 
Australia. Um, some people don't feel safe going to Mexico right now. So they look at the numbers in Hawaii and they come in here. <clears throat> as far as what can be done about the number of people, you know, it's hard to address that because you have airlines, right, that are going to be selling cheap tickets. And that's what they're doing right now. So the governor or the government cannot tell the airlines what to charge or how many flights to bring in. I mean, they can, they, as far as uh, the fees, the airport fees, they can address it that way. But like I said, it's not like a, a faucet. You can turn it on and turn it off. But, um, you know, I'm like any other local person. I, I want the tourists to come, but I want them to come responsibly. But then you see tourists today on the news playing with the monk seals, which there's signs all over the place. And they're going to get, um, I'm hoping that they're going to get prosecuted to the full effect of the, the law. I mean, you know, you don't want to see that kind of stuff when tourists come over here, irresponsible tourists. But then there's a lot of other tourists that come and, um, you know, are very, very responsible. They go do cleanups and stuff like that. Part of the big problem right now, and everybody knows this on Hawaii, is that uh, tourists, we don't have the inventory for rental cars. You know, we have the hotels are back, the hotels are back, but not all the hotels have all their employees back. And, you know, Paul Toner, who is a close friend of mine, uh, we talk a lot about, you know, inventory and, and you know, what's happening coming up in the, in the months to come. But the hotel rooms are there and they're going up to the rates that, that they used to charge before COVID, but they don't have the employees. And then the rental cars, I talked to the rental car agencies at the peak of um, before COVID, Dennis, we had over 20,000 rent a cars on this side, 20,000. After COVID, 10,000 of those cars were left Kauai. Before they left, there were um, ornaments on golf courses, at Kmart parking lot, at, you know, Kukui, I mean, um, Grove Farm in their, uh, some of their fields, and the grass was growing all over these rental cars, but they're all gone now. And, um, a lot of the companies said they're, they, they can't get cars. And I think you've seen it on, on television and the shows that you watch about the microchips. They're not, they, there is a big, big shortage of microchips. So the cars, they cannot produce the cars. <coughs> the Japanese car makers stocked up on chips, but the Americans, not so much. There is that problem. Um, there is, there, in the beginning of COVID, there was some uncertainty with some of the companies. Hertz went bankrupt, but then <coughs> Hertz, also purchased locally a lot of a lot of cars that they couldn't because they were in bankruptcy they couldn't purchase from the the manufacturers themselves. So is that good for the economy? Um, you know, not, I'm not sure because then local people you go to you go to King Auto right now you go to Kuhil Motors they don't have inventory. So if you're trying to find a car right now. Good luck on Kauai. Um, you're, you're certainly not going to be able to get the car that you want. So. Um, how do you fix that? That is, you know, you, you're a guy that likes to figure out things. If you can figure out an answer, because, you know, you, 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 if we continue on the path now, when the other countries open, we're not going to have the same occupancy, but you still have to market. And a lot of people are saying, well, we should be marketing to the high end tourists. I don't know about that. What about the smaller hotels? The sm but the smaller hotels bring in the, the discount uh, tourists. And, and some of the tourists come and they camp. And so you, you, you want to stop all of that? You want to stop some of that? Tell me how you stop it. That's all of it. That's what I would say about that. And I, and I know, you know, people say, oh, we got to move away from tourism. You cannot be an economy just based on in one thing like tourism. Okay, well, then what's the next thing? Because farming, I don't know if farming is going to be the answer because why? As you know, Dennis, coming from families that work in the farms, your brother, it's hard work. It's very hard work. You get one storm and you, you know your crop is gone. So what's going to be the next industry? Technology? I Man, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> That's why we have you in the legislature. Figure it all out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep. Uh, you made good points about you know tourism and housing. The next big topic we have is is housing. I mean, yes. So we think about, you know, what the state or the county doing. I got my thoughts, but. <laughs> I think, 
um, the house, the housing department on Hawaii uh, has done an, a great job. Um, you know, uh, I'm blanking on the name now, but it's the, the shelter for women in need by uh, the theater. You know, Kanani and Adam, you know, Kanani did that building in the front between the theater and that uh, water department. I didn't think that we could put that. I think it's 62 units over there. I don't think, I didn't think we could do that there. And it's going to be opening pretty soon. And the women in need shelter, that was the, in, in the whole, entire time that I've been in office, that was the fastest project that the government ever did. And it's awesome. But what I will say specifically about housing is a lot of people say, oh, you know, there's too many people coming from the mainland and they're buying houses on Kauai. Okay, let's analyze that. Who's selling them the houses on Kauai? It's Kauai people. And, you know, there's some people that move. There's some people that have land from parents and they sell the land. And guess what? They're not going to sell it for, you know, the, the Kama'aina friends and family rate. They're going to go to to the highest rate. And sometimes it's not going to be somebody a local person that's born and raised on Kauai that, that can afford it. <laughs> but to the guy selling it, he's trying to make as much as he can because he wants to buy land someplace else on the mainland, maybe, maybe another lot here or something else. But that's the, that's the biggest problem. And then unless you can tell me other, I mean, there's other things that are issues, but I, I, that's one of the things. And I would say like some of the vacation rental housing. So those, the people that have bought those houses in, you know, the VDA or other places, they, they, they want to make money, so they, they vacation rental it. And that's another problem that we have with housing. So, you know, yep. and, and water is the biggest choke point. You know that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you touch upon, you know, the uh, housing department doing a great job in expediting. They, they, yes, they are on the very low end. You know, they, yeah. they do fast track, they, you know, they exempt from a lot of the conditions, mm -hmm. but um, along that lines, the housing for the regular working class, they, you know, in, they get so many conditions, they get to satisfy, and there's no fast track. So time mm -hmm. takes, you know, many months, maybe years to do, you know, housing projects, and time is money. And uh, it gets some of the conditions, I think, you know, that got to be looked at to expedite I, that. Yeah. Uh, I agree, Dennis. But every time stuff comes up, there's a lot of political will to stop it. Yeah. But, you know, uh, affordable housing, let's talk about affordable housing. But before you get to that affordable house, you got to put in the drainage, you got to put in underground utilities, now you got to put in a solar water heater. And, you know, all of these things are good things, but it's going to make the price higher. So, you know, as as legislators, as we're going through the process of putting in these conditions to make the community better, it's also jacking up the price. You know, and we try to do 201H to uh, expedite stuff, but you know, there always seems to be chokeholds at different points. And you know, I'm sure there are better ways for us to do it, but it's it's difficult. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy. Uh, it's great to talk to you. At our uh, time is about to run out. Uh, we got so much more to talk about, maybe later, but uh, any closing words? No, you know, Dennis, just thank you for uh, reaching out to me to do this show. I mean, I, I appreciate it. I, I always enjoy talking to you and for, <laughs> for listeners who don't know you uh, very well. Dennis, you know, is not doing a lot of the talking on this show, but Dennis is a very <laughs> smart, funny guy. <laughs> and I always when we're talking, I'm always laughing at some of the things and your profound uh, knowledge that you have. So thank you for everything, Dan. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you to uh, Jimmy Tokioka for joining us today. Mahalo also to the viewing audience. If you enjoy the show and others, please support Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Dennis Isaki with Politics in Hawaii. Until next time, mahalo and aloha.